but uh, I I uh, lost the uh, stream for a second. Now I am back. Let me send out a quick message on Twitter, letting folks know that that's uh, that that's the case. Had a little hiccup. I am back streaming. Twitch.tv slash Ben underscore sniff Wi-Fi. Yeah, apologies for that, everybody who's uh, sticking with the stream. But yeah, so um, so yeah, the the uh, you know there's when you have some type of connection issue, you can use some of these tools to check the wireless side of the connection. You also want to check perhaps the networking side, perhaps the security side. And so, so that's, that's really what I want to make today's stream all about is kind of going through the process of really checking everything involved. Let's get rid of wireless diagnostics. We don't need that anymore. Really going through the process of checking everything that might uh, have some type of effect on the wireless connection so that Hopefully, uh, you can get yourself connected or get the users that you're supporting connected, and uh, you know, make it so that they uh, make make it so that they can uh, get online. I'm gonna try to be as exhaustive as I can. Really try to cover everything here. Try to try to cover the um, and this is this is just my uh, little intro page here. You can see. It's uh, March 25th. I try to do uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time stream every week. Um, I'm trying to uh, kind of figure out a way to do a second stream every week as well. I'm, I'm targeting Fridays at uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time. It'd be a little bit later for those of you over in uh, Europe uh, or, or in other parts of the world. But um, but I, I, I haven't quite figured out uh, getting that done. I, I say I've been saying this for like four or five weeks that I'm going to try to add that second stream on Fridays. Maybe this will finally be the week that I can uh, get that done. Something always seems to be I, I really thought I had it last week. And then last week um, I had a couple of uh, uh, remote interviews for a uh, for some work I'm trying to get. And, you know, speaking of which, you know, that's that's what I do right now is contracting work. Uh, in the Wi-Fi world, I, I teach Wi-Fi classes, I consult on Wi-Fi projects, I write about Wi-Fi. One of the places I write about Wi-Fi, although I haven't done it as much recently, is on my blog, sniffwifi.com, if you want to check it out. Uh, if you're watching this, there's a decent chance you're watching me on Twitch, so uh, much appreciated if you can uh, subscribe or follow on uh, Twitch, there should be a little button up up above me if you're uh, on Twitch right now. I know I also put these videos up on YouTube. Uh, if you're on YouTube, if you subscribe on YouTube, much appreciated there. And uh, my Twitter handle is at Ben Miller. Um, if you do want to get in touch with me for uh, any kind of uh, potential work or just general uh, questions or, or, or suggestions for topics to discuss about Wi-Fi, Email is a great way to do that. Ben underscore Miller at iCloud.com uh, is, uh, is the email address that I typically use. I, I do have another email associated with the blog, but um, I, that, that one uh, isn't particularly active right now. So uh, these are definitely the better ones. So yeah, so uh, the idea here is to talk about Wi-Fi connections, to talk about kind of uh, what happens when a Wi-Fi device makes its attempt to connect. So so let's go into the uh, whoops, there we go. Let's let's go in and and look a little bit here at a Wi-Fi device to get an example of what it might look like when it's connecting. You know, I'm sure. Those of you that are iPhone users are very familiar with this. If you go to a location and you, let me move this kind of centered a little more. If you go to a location and you decide you want to try to connect to the Wi-Fi network, uh, one way that you can do that is go to the settings for your uh, iPhone, your Wi-Fi device. You can tap where it says Wi-Fi. You'll see a list of Wi-Fi networks come up and you can tap on whichever network you want to uh, make a connection with. And, and so when the connection doesn't happen, the question then becomes, well, you know, how do I solve that? What's, and and I, I 
try to look at things very analytically. I, I try to look at things from a very logical perspective. And I try to really understand what's going on behind the scenes, kind, kind of understand the nature of how my little iPhone here is working. Whoops, I accidentally went to the next thing. Uh, understand the nature of how this little iPhone is working so that, you know, so that I that I can hopefully better troubleshoot it or or better design a network to make it work. You know, I, I just find understanding the intrinsic nature of how things work uh, is often very, very helpful for anytime you're working with it professionally. It's like, you know, it's like being a mechanic and understanding the full range of how the car works. You know, how I don't I don't really know much about cars, but how like, you know, the pistons and the engine are Maybe the pistons are part of the engine, for all I know. Um, <laughs> shows shows my level of ignorance on uh, on the car topic, but um, but yeah, it's just understanding kind of uh, how it works. And so, if I get back to the old uh, uh, whiteboard here, just just to kind of diagram out what I'm talking about a little bit. Hmm, having a little bit of an issue there, hopefully. Uh, no, that's not good. Okay. I think I have it open. There we go. Okay, yeah. So uh, the idea here is I have my little iPhone here. I have an iPhone 8, um, whatever the large version of the 8 is, the 8 Plus, maybe it's called, or 8S or something like that. And so what is happening when I try to connect? That is the question. What, what is everything that's going to have to happen for this phone um, in order to make its connection? Um, so kind of the first step that a phone is going to have to go through is it's going to have to try to find a wireless access point. Find an AP or access point. And uh, the finding of an access point is something that is done via a process called discovery. And luckily for us, there are a lot of applications out there that will really illustrate what the discovery process looks like. Or, or not, not necessarily what the process looks like, but uh, applications that will give you the information that the phone is gathering while the phone goes through discovery. Um, and those applications are commonly called Wi-Fi scanners. Uh, Wi-Fi scanners would include that, uh, I'll put them up here actually, I'll, uh, would include that airport utility that I was just showing uh, earlier on. That is for Apple iOS. That is a free application. Uh, the one I'm going to use is Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. Uh, that is a Mac OS application, and that is, I believe it's $100 or, you know, $99, something like that. Um, there is a lower cost version of Wi-Fi Explorer Pro that I believe is $19 or $20, somewhere around that range. The thing I like about Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, so the Pro version is the more expensive version, the non-Pro version is the less expensive version. Um, the, uh, oh, yeah, hey, great, uh, great tip there from Slim. Thank you very much, Slim. I did not know that. So I can press on the control panel's Wi-Fi icon to uh, select a different SSID. So I'll uh, bring that up uh, shortly to... Um, uh, to show you all that. That's, yeah, thank you. That's a great tip. Um, yeah, so Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, uh, it's a little bit more expensive than Wi-Fi Explorer regular, you know, the non-pro. Uh, the couple things that I really like about Wi-Fi Explorer Pro is you can use external devices to do your discovery, to do your scanning. Uh, so uh, one of the devices that's become a little bit popular in the Wi-Fi community, so to speak, is uh, this little device called a WLAN Pi. I think I might even have one on my desk. Oh yeah, there it is. Looks looks like this. It's a very very small device here, um, but you can 
plug in a little USB adapter to the WLAN Pi, and you can use it as a remote scanning device, a remote uh, discovery device if you want to with Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. The other nice thing, I mean, really the, the bigger thing for me of why I like Wi-Fi Explorer Pro is that I can import annotations for access points. Uh, especially if you're working with a large enterprise, like I, I noticed this when I was working for uh, USC a little bit while, uh, for uh, for about a year, a little while back. Um, one of the th you know USC has something like let's say eight thousand uh, wireless access points in their enterprise uh, on their main campus. I think the number is probably in the neighborhood of let's say forty five hundred uh, wireless access points. So a lot of wireless access points. Um, uh, that you know you might have to troubleshoot, that you might have to manage, uh, and so if you go to a given site, if you go to uh, an office where professors and researchers are, or you go to a building that has classrooms or an outdoor area or whatever, um, you'll get a lot of BSSIDs showing up in Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. In fact, I'll bring up Wi-Fi Explorer Pro right now. You'll get a lot of uh, BSSIDs showing up in Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, but you may not uh, you, you may not get um, sort of the information that you're specifically, or you you may not have a reference for what those BSSIDs are. And uh, so so you can see here, for example, this uh, this third column from the left, I'm able to see all of these BSSIDs that are. Uh, that are that are being seen. BSSID for those that may not be familiar is just the uh, wireless MAC address of an access point. Um, a single access point can have multiple BSSIDs, um, so it's so it's not necessarily the number of BSSIDs is not necessarily an indication of how many wireless access points there are. Each BSSID can represent a different network. You can kind of see that down here a little bit. Uh, if, if you look at the Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus, the cable Wi-Fi, the Spectrum Wi-Fi, uh, those three BSSIDs that accompany them, the, the three BSSIDs that start with C08A and end with 922C, those three BSSIDs are all coming from the same physical wireless access point. They're just representing three different networks, three different SSIDs, uh, Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus, Cable Wi-Fi, and Spectrum Wi-Fi. I, I took this scan this morning uh, before uh, before starting up with the stream here. Uh, you can see they're slightly different. If you look at the third from the last octet, they're all slightly different. Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus has a 76. Cable Wi-Fi has a 36. Spectrum Wi-Fi has a B6. Uh, B is in Bravo 6. Uh, so you can see that uh, those things are slightly different. And, uh, you know, th the issue is if you're going to a place where there's dozens or potentially hundreds of wireless access points that are within range of your device that's doing discovery, uh, it can be a little bit difficult to kind of remember, well, which BSSID was it for access point number 10? Which BSSID was it for access point number 15, etc.? Uh, and so Wi-Fi Explorer Pro has this little annotations column, and so you can kind of give it a name. You can say that this is, uh, you know, Spectrum AP1 or whatever it is. Whoops. Looks like my keyboard. Oh, is my keyboard. My keyboard is either dead or out of batteries. Ah, there we go. Looks like it's working now. So yeah, Spectrum, whoops, uh, AP1, we'll call it. But yeah, so this way I can uh, add this little annotation, and anytime I, uh, anytime I come back to this area where I was doing this scan this morning, I'll, I'll, I'll have that BSSID annotated as Spectrum AP1. You can all with Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, you can also um, import. Uh, a, a CSV. Oh, well, actually, you're not going to be able to see that there. Let me see if I can do it on the other screen. You know what? I'm going to have to drag this over to be able to make that happen. So give me just a moment here.
but yeah, then I can uh, go up to the file menu, choose annotations. I can import from a spreadsheet. So if you have a spreadsheet with a bunch of access point names and with a bunch of BSS IDs, then you can uh, import all of those in there and can make your uh, analysis of discovery a little bit simpler. So yeah, that's the uh, that's sort of the idea there with um, with that. But but again, when when it comes to the discovery process, process, what I'm seeing here in Wi-Fi Explorer Pro is just the same thing that my laptop saw earlier today when my laptop was doing discovery. That's 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 what this is showing. Um, let's see here. Uh, ah, gotcha. So uh, never ne uh, never mind with the Pro for. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, I, so Slim is saying that uh, the annotation import also works in the non-pro version of Explorer. So my mistake. So it looks like with the uh, pro version, the the one benefit at least that I use is the um, is the use of external devices to do uh, to do this discovery to do this scanning but the annotations part of it is something that you'll get regardless that uh, where you don't need the pro version. Either way, whether you're gonna use the pro version, whether you're gonna use the um, regular version of Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, um, I find it's a nice tool to have. Getting back to the list here of, uh, getting back to, to a quick list here of uh, Wi-Fi scanners. I mentioned a couple uh, that are Apple related. If you are a Windows user, uh, at least the uh, application that I use for Windows-based scanning is Acrylic Wi-Fi. And uh, I'm trying to remember what exactly Acrylic calls it. It's been a little while since I've done a Windows scan, but I think it's called Acrylic Wi-Fi Pro. I'm gonna put a little question mark there. You know, I'll... I'll when I get off of the whiteboard, I'll, uh, I'll I'll go to the web page for acrylic, so you can take a look at that here. Um, but uh, with acrylic Wi-Fi Pro, that one I know for sure. You have to buy the licensed version of acrylic to be able to import annotations. Um, the uh, free version of acrylic Wi-Fi is called Home. That's the free version, and uh, that version does not allow you to import annotations into. Uh, uh, via a CSV file. And and Slim, do you know if, um, so you're saying the import does work. Okay, good. So the CSV import does work for, uh, what I was going to ask is, can you import a CSV or is it just something where you can manually add annotations one by one? But uh, what Slim's saying is you can uh, do that uh, on a larger scale. Uh, and then if you have to support Android, the application that I like to use is Aruba Utilities. Um, there's another, uh, whoops, utilities. Uh, there's uh, another application that's also relatively popular for Android called uh, Wi-Fi Analyzer. I, I noticed there's actually a number of Android applications called Wi-Fi Analyzer. The one from the developer called Farproc or Farproc, F-A-R-P-R-O-C. Uh, that's the uh, scanner, at least, that I like best. Uh, so yeah, so you can get this uh, discovery information uh, if you want to. And uh, again, let me share that with you here real quick. Let's uh, bring up acrylic Wi-Fi and do a little bit of sharing with you all. Whoops, I must have messed something up. Hmm. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Give me just a moment. I thought I had my uh, window all set up, but I guess I did not. There we go. Okay, so it's a little bit on so it fits on the page a little bit better here.
So yeah, here's the uh, web page for acrylic Wi-Fi. As you can see, it comes from Spain. The application does. You can change uh, the language of the website to English. And uh, yeah, let's check maybe under products. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so yeah, acrylic Wi-Fi Pro, this one in the middle. That's the one that uh, allows you to import uh, a, a large CSV to, to make it so you can uh, kind of look at, uh, yeah, look at a lot of uh, um, access point names all at once, get get all those access point names imported all at once. Uh, also, uh, but you know, just a real quick touch on something that Slim mentioned. And again, Slim, thank you for uh, the info here. Um, so what he was saying was rather, whoops, rather than having to go through the whole, um, uh, process of tapping on settings and then adding a new network, uh, if you go to the control panel, so you kind of swipe up from the bottom of the screen, tap and hold on Wi-Fi, uh, then he was saying that, uh, you get the ability to, or do you get the ability to... Ah, there we go. So tap and hold again. Then you get the ability to go to Wi-Fi settings and uh, you can choose from the networks there or you can choose from your networks without even going to Wi-Fi settings. Um, you can see the list of uh, networks without Wi-Fi settings if you want. So yeah, so um, so again, the, the first step that a Wi-Fi device is going to go through is discovery. We can see discovery uh, information by looking at these Wi-Fi scanners, but let, let's go a little bit deeper than that. Let's, again, at least from my point of view, I, I really want to understand how something works. If I'm going to troubleshoot it, if I'm going to try to design a network for it. Um, and so what I want to talk about here is a little bit more detail on how, how discovery works. Um, give me just a moment here. Sorry, having a little bit of trouble with the whiteboard. There we go. Technical issues, nothing new when it comes to uh, my stream. But yeah, so what we're looking at here is how discovery works. So here I am, Ben Miller. My nice stick figure drawing here. Here I am with my beautiful iPhone 8 Plus. I am walking into an area. This area has Wi-Fi. There's the little access point broadcasting out Wi-Fi. And so what, what is my phone going to do here as part of this discovery process? Um, the first little note about discovery is that the SSID must match. So when my phone looks to make a connection to a wireless access point, my phone is only going to look for wireless access points that carry the same SSID as my phone, but also have the same authentication type and the same encryption type. We've talked about security a little bit here in the uh, in the past on the stream uh, on the uh, weekly stream. Um, I, I don't know that we've ever really gone into kind of uh, uh, detail on exactly what the encryption types and what the authentication uh, authentication types are in Wi-Fi. But here's basically what they are for authentication type. You have three options. You have WPA2 Enterprise, which is also known as 802.1x EAP. Uh, you have WPA2 Personal, which is also, whoops, forgot to close parentheses there. WPA2 Personal is also known as PSK or pre-shared key authentication, sometimes known as passphrase authentication. And then your third option is open authentication. So <clears throat> on your uh, phone, you're going to configure what the SSID is, what the authentication type is. When you go through the process that I just went through, when you, you know, 
tap and hold, as as Slim very helpfully mentioned there, to uh, to get into the Wi-Fi set. You know, you go to the control panel, you tap and hold to get into the Wi-Fi settings. You tap on the Wi-Fi network to get a list of networks. Uh, it, as soon as you tap on an SSID in an attempt to connect, your phone immediately understands which encryption type and which authentication type is being used by that SSID. The, the only reason I'm kind of emphasizing here that you have to have the same authentication type and the same encryption type is that can be relevant for cases where the phone is going through some type of roaming. That can be relevant if there are any kind of attacks or hacking going on. That can be relevant for people who sort of come and go from a, a given area. So, meaning if you want people to be able to seamlessly roam between the access points in your enterprise, the access points not only have to have the same SSID available, but they also have to have the same uh, authentication type, whichever one of the three you're using, and the same encryption type, whatever one of the three you're using. G generally speaking, the encryption type is going to be either AES, CCMP, or open you know, or an unencrypted network. Those are uh, the two options. The, the third option that you might see with some newer stuff, I'm, I'm not really aware of any enterprise support for this. Maybe maybe Slim or anyone else uh, might, might be able to correct me on this if there is more enterprise support. But you also might see support for OWE. Um, OWE is sort of an SSL-like type of encryption. Uh, that is for open Wi-Fi encryption networks. So it would be open encryption along with an SSL. Whoops, I'm, I'm kind of writing over my head there. Um, sorry about that. But uh, but yeah, that's, that OWE is kind of uh, SSL-like. But yeah, so... Um, so what the, the point is, on my uh, iPhone, on my laptop, whatever device it is, when I click or when I tap on an SSID, my phone automatically knows whatever authentication type that SSID is using, automatically knows whatever encryption type I'm using. Uh, however, when it comes to roaming between access points or when it comes to uh, devices that are going to leave an area and then come back, or, or maybe for an organization that has a number of different locations, you know, retail locations, uh, or sorry, uh, retail enterprises that might have different locations in different shopping centers, uh, for example, or, or different department store locations uh, where you want to use a consistent uh, uh, Wi-Fi configuration profile. Uh, for those, you just, you know, you just want to make sure that the authentication and the encryption match. Uh, when it comes to attacks, you know, the key thing there is, even if a hacker sets up a fake Wi-Fi network using my SSID, using the same TDG Press SSID, if the hacker is not using the same authentication type or the same encryption type, my phone is going to disregard that network. My phone is not going to proceed in, in attempting to connect to that network. So again, the first criteria that any client device has is the client is going to look for an SSID that matches. The second criteria, and I know this is going to sound like a little bit of a cop-out, uh, is potentially something that is vendor-specific. So once you get past the SSID, let, let's, you know, let's say you have a, a, a large open office space. Let's say for your open office space, you have 15 access points scattered throughout the office uh, to be able to uh, provide Wi-Fi for the number of users, for the locations, you know, for the for the coverage, for the capacity, for roaming, for, for everything that you need. So you have those 15 access points uh, set up there. Uh, and let's say, as in a typical office, you're supporting a number of different types of Wi-Fi devices. Um, maybe you let people choose their type of laptop, maybe you let people choose their type of cell phone, maybe maybe uh, your, uh, the, the workers in the office are expected to kind of bring in their own cell phone if they want to bring a, uh, use a cell phone, what, whatever the case may be. So if you're trying to set up Wi-Fi for this office or if you're trying to troubleshoot people's connections for this office, 
one thing you want to do, of course, is have a consistent SSID for people to connect to with a consistent authentication and encryption type on all 15 access points. But then another thing you want to be aware of is that different devices may have sort of different ways of evaluating which of those 15 access points the device will attempt to connect to. If we have more than just one AP, if we have, again, an office with 15 APs, maybe maybe a, a typical client can't see all 15 APs at a given time, but maybe it can see three or four or five APs um, at a given time. Sort of the second uh, 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 thing that a device is going to do when it's going through discovery is is uh is 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 potentially going to be vendor specific is, is going to be something that doesn't apply across all vendors now one thing we can say is that even though different vendors handle things differently every vendor is going to have some method of doing what we call passive scanning and active scanning the passive scan means listen for beacons the active scan means send probe requests and then after sending probe requests listen for probe responses The question is, how is the device going to do that? Is the device going to listen for beacons on every channel first and then do probing? Is the device going to do some probing first and then if the device doesn't find what it's looking for, then it's going to listen for beacons? Is the device going to probe on every channel or on targeted channels? There's all sorts of different variations in how Wi-Fi devices do what they do. And if you're really looking to optimize your Wi-Fi deployment, learning how the devices that you have to support, the more important devices that you have to support do this stuff, do the passive scanning and the active scanning, can be very, very useful. For example, uh, there was one job I was on. This is uh, a few years ago, if I'm remembering correctly. This would have been early 2018, I believe it was, if I'm remembering that correctly. I'd have to go back and look, but I'm pretty sure that was uh, early 2018. So it's early 2018, and this is uh, a large open office area, um, and... I would say that the majority of the people in this uh, large op open office area were using iPhones. We definitely had some employees and guests that would use Android phones as well. But at this particular organization, the employees just for whatever reason seemed to prefer iPhones. And, and so we had a lot of iPhones in the area. So as, as part of this job, before I ever came on site, you know, I had talk to the folks who, uh, who who work as kind of the day-to-day -day network engineers to ask them, you know, what does your device profile look like? Are you more Android? Are you more iPhone? Whatever. Uh, they mentioned they were more iPhone. And so I, I went in and I did as much research as I could on how Apple iOS devices were behaving at that time when it came to this kind of vendor-specific part of discovery. And one thing I noticed was that Apple iOS devices almost immediately would start probing. That that that's not something that's universal. Uh, with some devices, they may listen for beacons for quite a while before they ever send out any kind of probe request uh, looking for access points. But at least at that time, a couple years ago, with Apple iOS devices, they were probing very very quickly. So that was kind of one thing, is uh, very, very quick probing. They, the devices were not spending a lot of time doing, uh, uh, doing uh, listening for beacons before they started probing. And then another thing that I noticed about the device is they were doing probing on sort of what I'll call known channels. Meaning if my iPhone 
had connected in an office previously to an access point that is on channel number 104, my device, when it came back and was attempting to connect to that same SSID, would sort of start its probing on channel 104. Rather than just kind of starting from the bottom and going up, rather than saying, well, I'm going to probe on channel 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, you know, all all the way up to channel 165, uh, or rather than maybe, you know, uh, another thing I noticed about uh, Apple devices is Apple devices definitely preferred the 5 gigahertz band. For those of you that uh, may not be familiar with the 5 gigahertz band, the 5 gigahertz band is channels numbered 36 to 165. And so the, uh, you know, instead of the iPhone, let's say starting on channel 36 and probing, then 40, then 44, then 48, the iPhone would, if the access point that I had previously connected to was on channel 104, the iPhone would probe on channel 104 probe on whatever the channel the next access point was, let's say 36, probe on whatever channel the next access point was, let's say channel 161. So the iPhone would kind of probe on targeted channels first, looking for access points that the iPhone remembered from previous connections. And so one of the things that we did at that office, which really ended up improving the overall quality of the Wi-Fi, we ended up more consistent connections, faster initial connections, smoother roaming. I don't want to act like things ended up being perfect at the office. It was a difficult situation. I came in after the installation. I was not involved with the design of this network at all. I came in after the installation and one of the mandates on the project was avoid changing the design at all costs. We do not want to have to add new access points we do not want to have to move any access points. And so unless we have like a super emergency situation where we're going to have a major, major production issue in this office, if if we don't uh, change the design, don't change the design. And, and so I didn't change the design. But what that meant was we still had a couple of areas in this. It was about a million square feet total. Uh, we had a couple of little areas amongst the million square feet where uh, where there were still some uh, uh, mild roaming issues on some devices. It was like we, we would have some folks that would tell us that the roaming wasn't great. We would test in certain areas and we would see that in those same areas where some people didn't have great roaming, we were still getting good roaming. So we were able to fix it up fairly well. Uh, but the bottom line it, there is that that's, that's, that's one thing that's a little bit tricky about this discovery process is a lot of it will be vendor specific. Now, a third thing that I will mention down here is typically RSSI is going to play a role somehow. It's like my iPhone might scan on channel 104 because it remembers connecting to the SSID of TDG Press on channel 104. My iPhone may scan on 36 or 161 or or whatever other channels it recommends or it remembers seeing access points on uh on on that network on the tdg press network but ultimately when my iphone chooses to kind of proceed with the next step of the connection after discovery usually rssi is going to play a significant role usually the iPhone is going to gravitate towards whichever access point is showing the strongest signal strength to the access point. So a couple of things that that caused us to do for for the specific case that that I uh, was mentioning earlier on, uh, one was use a uniform transmit power for all access points, for all APs. You know, the, the idea we had was if we have this big open office area and we have, you know, it was, it was kind of uh, designed in a in a kind of a diagonal pattern. That's that's how best I could describe these uh, um, the act, the way the access points were uh, set up in this office. So, you know, there, there were these uh, walkways in between people's desks that were kind of diagonally and the access points would be mounted above the walkways. Um, so the the thing that we were very very concerned about here was 
if we have one access point, let's say using a 12 dBm uh, transmit power, uh, by the way, if, if you're working with an Aruba system, Aruba calls this conducted power. Make sure uh, you do an Aruba design based on conducted power, not transmit power. Transmit power, if you use transmit power with Aruba, you end up with a lot of problems. Uh, 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 conducted power is it, I actually talked about that last week that's still up on the archive so if you're curious about that whole thing la last week's uh, Twitch stream is a little bit of a long one but um, you know it it, uh, it it does go through uh, the whole conducted power transmit power thing uh, so rather than having let's say 12 dBm for one of them and let's say 17 dBm for the other one for the other access point and having some type of range of conductive power, the, the concern I had there was because of the fact that these iPhones were really focusing on RSSI when making their connection, this 17 dBm uh, access point would propagate its signal a little bit further and it would be possible that my poor little iPhone here, let's say my iPhone is closer to the 12 dBm access point, my poor little iPhone may get a stronger signal from the 17 dBm access point. And you don't want that. You want to have your phones connected to the access point that is physically closest to them. You know, radio waves travel at the speed of light, so there is going to be a split second delay in every packet, in every frame, just based on the distance that the radio waves have to travel from AP to client or from client to AP. And so getting your clients as close as possible from a distance perspective to the APs is usually beneficial. I didn't want to have cases like I'm drawing here where a client is connecting to an AP that's further away just because that AP had a higher conducted power, had a higher transmit power. So one of the things we did was uniform transmit power on all of our APs. Um, if I'm remembering this job correctly, I think we chose 11 dBm for the 2.4 gigahertz band, and I believe we chose 14 dBm for the 5 gigahertz band. We had a lot of disabled uh, 2.4 gigahertz radios because it was an open office, because it was just so easy for those radio waves to propagate out and potentially interfere with one another. Um, so, so that was one thing we did. And then the other thing we did uh, was we freezed uh, the uh, channel selections. Th this was a Cisco environment. And in this, Cisco, Cisco uses a protocol called RRM, Radio Resource uh, Ma Management. Sorry. Uh, radio Resource Management. And what we did was we let RRM run for a couple of days. And then before we completed the project, we took a look in Cisco Prime Infrastructure at the floor plans just to kind of make sure that we didn't have things that kind of didn't make sense, you know, make sure we didn't have access points that were adjacent to one another on the same channel or clusters where certain channels were being used but certain other channels were being avoided. Um, so it, we, uh, you know, once we kind of confirmed that things made sense. And, and we ended up having to make uh, manual changes with a few stragglers. For a few straggler access points, we did have to change their channel manually. Uh, but once we made sure that that made sense, then we just freezed uh, all of the uh, channels on all of the access points. Um, and the idea there is that this way, the iPhones, which again, were kind of the predominant Wi-Fi device in this office, uh, this way, the iPhones would establish their initial connections more quickly, would have their roaming connections happen more quickly and more consistently. Um, and at least as best I could tell, it it led to uh, it led to a pretty dramatic improvement. I, you know, look, it wasn't like a project where I was there on site for the next year or something like that, where I could really kind of gather data and, and get an idea if, if these uh, improvements had made a, a huge difference. But at least during the time I was there, uh, they seem to uh, make a pretty big difference. So that that's just an example of uh, a couple of things that you can do if you really learn about the client discovery process. And, you know, to, to learn about the client discovery process, a lot of what that involves is just captures. You know, he, here's a capture that I took 
of my iPhone connecting earlier in the day on that Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus network, or earlier in the day today, on that Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus network that uh, that I showed you all in um, in uh, Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, this is just a capture done with my Mac. Um, the way you can uh, do these captures is in that same wireless diagnostic application. I'll uh, bring that up again really, really quickly. And, and actually, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, one way you can do it is with wireless diagnostics if you're uh, on a Mac. Open wireless diagnostics, go to the sniffer window, and then you can choose which channel you want to make your capture on. There's your list of all your Wi-Fi channels. You can choose which channel. You can choose what channel width you want to make the capture on. Um, and then another thing, another way to uh, do your captures is there's a free application by Adrian Granados. He's the same one. He's the same person that makes Wi-Fi Explorer. Um, Adrian Granados made this free application called Air Tool. Uh, hopefully you can see it right there. Air Tool just runs as a little icon up on the top menu bar of a Mac computer. And uh, with Air Tool, kind of similar thing. I can uh, choose which channel number I want to capture on. I see my list of channels here. Actually, some of them are being blocked by my head. Let me move my head a little. Whoops. Let me move my head a little bit here. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, but yeah, so I can uh, choose my list of from my list of channels here. I can choose my channel width that I want to capture on. You even get a few other little uh, capture options that you can choose from, uh, and then uh, you can choose to capture. You can even do a scanning capture. You can just capture every channel uh, for a, a certain amount of time. It allows you to customize which channels you want to capture on, so you can choose uh, um, you know which channels you're going to use if you're doing a multi-channel capture. One of the nice things about using Airtool is it allows you to change the channel of your capture in mid-capture. One of the limitations of wireless diagnostics is uh, that you have to stop your capture if you want to change channels. So if you find for whatever reason that the client device that you're trying to troubleshoot or analyze has moved to a different access point and has changed channels, with wireless diagnostics, you got to stop the capture and then restart on a different channel. Uh, with Airtool, you don't have to do that. With Airtool, this stays open. The downside is, you know, you got to download and install Airtool. It is a free application, but some people don't like uh, installing too much stuff on their uh, on their devices, which I guess I'm sympathetic to. Sometimes it can be a little bit annoying to have too many applications. But yeah, getting back to uh, Wireshark here, let's bring that up. So here is my look at Wireshark. And what I can do here is I can really identify kind of, uh, you know, the behavior of my device. Now, here's a key thing to understand about uh, Apple iOS devices. And actually, I better bring up the old whiteboard here real quickly. I, I should have probably mentioned this earlier on, but it's such an important point. I want to make sure... It's not just in the notes area because I know on uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you don't have the ability to see what I write in the notes area. Uh, but a, a, a big kind of uh, a, a big kind of thing to uh, be aware of here um, is uh, that when it comes to uh, Apple iOS devices, whoops, and I, I believe this might also apply to Mac OS. I'll say also Mac OS question uh, mark. A big thing to understand about those devices is those devices use a fake Mac address during discovery. Fake Mac address during discovery. And so it can be a little bit tricky if you're trying to do captures, identify your uh, client device's behavior as part of a troubleshooting process or as part of a, a, a wireless adjustment or as part of um, the design process. You, you just want to be aware of that fact that while your client device is doing discovery, you're not going to see that client device 
it, it, you're not going to see that client device's MAC address is uh, is the basic limitation here. So let me uh, let me kind of show you what I'm talking about here by bringing back up Wireshark uh, and also bringing back up my phone. So I'm looking at my phone here. Uh, in order to kind of search in Wireshark, in order to sort of find uh, my phone's behavior, uh, you can do a little Wireshark filter. If you look at that little green bar up there towards the top of the screen in Wireshark, that's where you can put in filter expressions. And a commonly used filter to kind of look at one device's behavior is WLAN.ADDR. You can do the filter WLAN.ADDR uh, followed by just the MAC address of whatever device you're looking for. Uh, could be a client device, could be an access point, whatever you want, really. Um, and uh, hold on just. Sorry about that, everybody. Had to uh, take care of a, a little red flag that was happening in the uh, room adjacent to me. Uh, apologies. Uh, but yeah, so, and uh, Slim, I see uh, your question there. Definitely get to that in just a moment. So yeah, you can choose the MAC address of whatever device you want. And so in my case, I want to find out how my iPhone is behaving. And so if I bring back the iPhone, I can find my iPhone's wireless MAC address. I suppose I could probably find it even easier by just swiping up from the bottom, tapping and holding to get the, that uh, list of uh, networks. If we want that guy on. And if I tap on, I think that was the case. If I tap on it again, or maybe not. Yeah, looks like I'm doing something wrong here, unfortunately. Ah, there we go. Sorry, I had to tap and hold a second time. But yeah, I get to the Wi-Fi settings. Now that I'm in the Wi-Fi settings, uh, to find the wireless MAC address, you just go back to the general settings screen and you go to settings, general about. There it is, settings, general about. I see my little MAC address there. And so you can probably follow in the background as I'm typing it in here in Wireshark. You want to put that MAC address in so that you can uh, kind of isolate only the traffic that is going to or from your iPhone. There we go. So yeah, now what, what you're seeing in Wireshark is only the traffic that was going to or from my iPhone earlier this morning as I was trying to connect to that uh, to that network, to the Spectrum Plus network. Now, notice, so I, I guess I, I should clarify something. So what I was saying to you earlier was the iPhone is going to use a fake MAC address when it's doing its discovery. But that's not entirely true. The, the iPhone is going to use a fake MAC address when it's doing its discovery, except for in sort of the last moment before it connects. So notice here, my iPhone uses the, uh, sends this little probe request, a couple of these little probe requests, right before it makes its connection. This authentication, this authentication, this association, association, request identity. Those of you that may have joined me for some earlier episodes here, some earlier streams, uh, may remember that the identity response is where you can see your username. So that's the username I use for my uh, cable for my cable company to uh, you know log into this Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus network. Uh, all the way right through the little uh, keys, the the success message saying I've successfully authenticated, and then the keys are how my iPhone and the cable company's network negotiate encryption keys. Uh, so. You know, so, so you are seeing a little bit of discovery here. You are seeing a little bit of probing here, but you're not seeing the full spectrum of probing. You're not seeing all of the probing that's happening from my Wi-Fi device because of the fact that Apple devices will use fake MAC addresses when probing. And so the question then is kind of, you know, how do you know what your iPhone is actually doing? Let, let's say you are in this situation where 
you know you have to support a lot of iPhones. You want to try to design your wireless network so that it's as iPhone friendly as possible. Maybe, maybe you're thinking, maybe I'll do the uniform transmit power. Maybe I'll do the freezing of the channels. I think Aruba uses the term maintain. Uh, freeze, if I'm remembering correctly, is the Cisco term for uh, keeping the same channel. I believe Aruba, the command you use is maintain. Uh, if, if you use uh, maintain, it's, it's also something you can select in the GUI uh, for Aruba. But yeah, so if you want, if you are thinking of doing those things, if you say, well, it, see, you know, it seems like it would be nice to have a better iPhone friendly Wi-Fi network where, where I'm supporting, uh, you know, the concern then becomes, well, how am I going to find what my iPhone was doing if my iPhone's using a fake MAC address? And at least the way I handle that is by looking at signal strength. I can see here that notice whenever my phone is the source, so this little Apple underscore 47 B038 in the source column, source column second from your left. Whenever I see that my Apple device is the source, take a look at the signal column. I'll even bring the signal column over so you can see it a little bit more clearly. Notice the signal, It's it tends to be very close to negative 35, you see the negative 36, the negative 37, even one that went up as high as negative 42. This one that's negative 42 is probably from a different channel. Uh, that, that was probably some other channel that the uh, iPhone was probing on. I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but it might have been. Uh, client devices do not indicate which channel they were using when they were transmitting uh, inside the frame. So it's like, if I look at this little frame here, it'll tell me that the frame was captured on channel number 149. So uh, I believe that's in the radio tap header. Yes, radio tap header. It tells me it was captured on 149. That does not mean that the frame was transmitted on 149. That frame might've been transmitted on a different channel and showed up with a lower signal strength, a lower RSSI, because the frame was transmitted on channel 153, let's say, instead of 149. I, I don't know that to be the case. It, the, the frame might have been transmitted on 149 and just come in at a signal strength that was six or seven decibels lower. That type of thing does happen sometimes. Maybe, you know, I was outdoors when I did this. Maybe like a truck drove by uh, in, in between where the access point is mounted and where I was sitting outside. And maybe that caused for a six decibel loss for that particular, um, actually, sorry, that wouldn't be the case because, uh, my, my phone was close enough to the uh, laptop where there wouldn't have been a truck. Maybe I was moving my phone around too much and, and that's why it was a little bit different. Um, but so, so I wanted to, so looking at signal strength is, is what you want to do before I get into that. I do want to uh, address Slim's question since it's been a little bit. Uh, he says, going back to the open office example, how do I handle people or desks that happen to fall in contention zones where the access point cells overlap? And the idea there is just to try to avoid co-channel interference. Uh, if you do, you know, if, if you do have an area where some, uh, a walking area or where someone's desk is sort of exactly halfway between two different access points, as long as those two access points are operating on different channels, and as long as the other access points that the client device and that your access point can hear are on different channels, typically you can avoid having problems. For this particular office, open office area, it was such, some of the floors, it was a eight story building. Um, some of the floors, you, and, and if you do the math there, right? Eight story building, 1 million square feet. So, so these were gigantic floors. They were, these were very, very, very large floors. These weren't like the typical office building size floors. And so for this particular building, um, we, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the area was so vast. The, the, the floor plan was so vast and, and there were so many access points installed as part of the design that we did have issues where someone would be someone's desk would be located in a given area and their phone or their laptop would see more access points than there were channels uh, for this particular location we were allowed to use up to 20 
five gigahertz channels, or actually I think it was a little bit less than 20. I think it might've been 19. So we were allowed to use 19 five gigahertz channels uh, total. And there were a lot of areas of the office where a scan from an iPhone or a scan from a laptop or a scan from an Android device would show more than 19 access points hitting that iPhone or hitting that Android phone. And so we actually had to disable some five gigahertz radios. We, you know, we had some access points where, you know, usually it's very, very rare where you would disable a five gig, an access points, five gigahertz radios. But we, we actually had to disable some of those uh, just because of that. And we had so many access points that we didn't really have to worry about getting a strong enough signal everywhere. We just ended up having to worry a little bit about interference there. Um and, and, and yeah, and, and yeah, so that, that was at least how we handled that is just, uh, you, you know, looking at the channels that we're using, trying to avoid co-channel interference. Cause it's fine to have two access points, five access points, 10 access points, 20 access points, um, you know, that, that are in a given area, as long as they're on different channels. Um, that for this particular one, though, Slim, that did end up a, um, uh, that that did end up being a uh, um, uh, something that we had to deal with. We did see that in some older iPhone models, and I don't know if it was because the algorithm for discovery was different than some of the newer models, or if it was because the older iPhones just didn't have the horsepower, you know, just didn't have the same processing power as the new ones. We were seeing that some of the older iPhones were having a little bit more trouble roaming. And I was banging my head against the wall during this project. Like, why would that be? Why, you know, we, we go and survey a given area. We don't see significant interference in the area. But these darn phones are just taking forever to get off their old access point, get onto their new access point, e even though the operating system was the same. Like that was one of the first things we told the user was, well, look, we've done our testing with this newer version of iOS. Can you upgrade? And we had some users who were like, ah, I don't know if I want to with my old phone. But even for the users who did acquiesce and who did upgrade their phones, we, we just found that some of the phones were slower roaming. And what I ended up trying, we, we did do a little bit of trial and error there. But what I ended up trying that seemed to work was disabling the lower data rates on the access points. Uh, we had, so the initial, one of the things I mentioned in the initial proposal when I was sort of trying to get hired for the project was, you know, that one of the ideas and, and one of the things that can help is adjusting how the data rates are configured. And if I'm remembering it correctly, when I got there, initially the minimum data rate that was used uh, by access points was 12 megabits per second. And I lowered it to six megabits per second, which is, you know, sort of the default, which is the, the lowest uh, number with, uh, with OFDM technology. And the reason for that was if you have 12 megabits per second as your minimum basic rate, you can't see your interference. Some some of your co-channel interference is going to be invisible because of the fact that the physical layer header always travels at six megabits per second and the physical layer header can cause channel time to be eaten up. So unless your beacons are at six megabits per second, you can't see the true range of where channel time is being eaten up here. I'll, 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 hopefully it's making sense what I'm saying, but I'll bring up the whiteboard to try to illustrate it a little bit, um, you know, j just in case it's not 100% clear. Sorry, it takes me a second to get the whiteboard going here. But yeah, the, the idea there was that we would have access points in this office. Here's my access points in the office. And these access points were all using a minimum basic rate of 12 megabits per second, 12, 12 megabits per second. And so when you were doing any kind of surveying or any kind of scanning, you could see how far the access point was traveling, but only to the 12 megabit per second boundary. The physical layer header 
always is 6 megabits per second. And the physical layer header uh, has the ability to use channel time. Uses channel time. And, and not just the channel time but for the header, but the channel time for the whole frame. And the reason why this is the case is the physical layer header uh, has this length field. And the length field indicates how long a client or an access point is supposed to stay quiet after it hears the physical layer header in order for the rest of the frame to complete, in order for the Mac layer header and the data and the IP header and everything like that to complete. And so one of the concerns I had for this office was that they had the minimum basic rate set to 12 and there was this whole other range here of sort of the six megabits per second boundary where this access point was causing interference, causing CCI, co-channel interference, but, but we couldn't see it. And so that was, that was one of the things that I kind of mentioned during even just the bidding process is, oh, this is something we can look at. And I, I think it was something that really helped me get hired on the project uh, just because it, it was something that the, the network engineering folks in the group uh, didn't seem like they were aware of or hadn't heard of from the design folks. And I'll get to uh, uh, Nam, uh, Nam N. Udler or Nam Nudler. Uh, sorry, I know I haven't uh, uh, gotten to some of these questions yet. Um, I'll get to those questions in a second, but that, that was something that the network engineering folks uh, for this uh, organization that had this big open office space, um, I, I, I don't think they had been exposed to that information by the design folks, that when the folks did the initial design and the initial installation of the access points, they didn't mention like, oh, if you use this minimum basic rate of 12, you might have these CCI issues that you can't really see, that you that, that you can't really identify with a Wi-Fi scanner. So as, as, as we we're going through the project, that was one of the things I kind of mentioned to the network engineering folks, hey, let's set the, uh, um, the minimum basic rate to six. A minimum basic rate to six gives you very, very minimal extra overhead. A minimum basic rate of six, it, if you have three SSIDs, you're going to lose about 1.8% of your channel time uh, due to beacon overhead. Minimum basic rate of 12, if you have three SSIDs, you're going to lose somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1.3% of your channel time. So, you know, you see the difference there. It's like, and, and I'm trying to remember, I think they were using exactly three SSIDs. If I'm remember, actually, you know what? I think they might have been using four or five SSIDs. I've only done the calculations for three. That's why I'm using three. But you see the difference here, and it's like so for this extra one half of one percent of performance, right? Like one half of one percent of my channel time that I'm improving for that benefit that I'm getting here for the minimum basic rate of twelve. I'm losing the ability to really see co-channel interference in a lot of these areas. So I kind of pitched that to them and said, look, this is something we can look at. And sure enough, once we set them in a basic rate to six, we saw co-channel interference all over the place that we hadn't seen before. And, and so then we knew that that was one of the issues why they were having big problems at this office. Um, and so with, uh, um, it, it, but the downside of that was some of these older iPhones, even when we updated them to the latest OS, what I what my hypothesis was was the older iPhones might not have the horsepower to see so many access points. You know, once we set the minimum basic rate to six, and once we could see the true scope of co-channel interference in these scanner tools, then that made it so that just normal client devices would also see a ton of access points when they were going through discovery. And I think what was happening was some of these older devices, they might see 15 access points with whatever the number was, three or four, or maybe it was even five SSIDs per access point. And so having to process all of those beacons during the discovery process and potentially probe responses during the discovery process might have been slowing those uh, iPhones down. So one of the things we ended up doing 
was we did end up going back to the 12 megabit per second minimum basic rate. And, you know, I, I just I just told the guys who work there, you know, for their long term is, look, you know, just keep in mind, you can't see the real co-channel interference. So if you think you do have a co-channel interference problem in the future, you might have to, you know, go in, adjust, you know, change the minimum basic rate back to six megabits per second, maybe doing it, do it in the middle of the night or something where very few people are in the office. But you may have to change that back to six megabits per second to get a true indication of where you have co-channel interference. But for now, we've got to go back to 12 megabits per second as our minimum basic rate. So that way, these older iPhones will see fewer access points and hopefully complete their discovery process more quickly so that they'll roam more seamlessly. And again, it's always hard to tell when you're only on the project. I think I was on this project, if I remember correctly, it was a two-week project. If you're only on a project for two weeks, you know, it's it's a little bit tough to tell what the ultimate impact was. But at least during the time I was there, it seemed to help things out a little bit for those, uh, for those devices, for the um, older iPhone devices. So yeah, so and let me bring back uh, Wireshark here. So yeah, that's, that, that was at least, you know, something that we ended up looking at. Uh, just to run through a couple of those questions there. Um, let's see here. So yeah, Nam Nudler said, uh, why were there so many APs? Um, th that I was not part of the design process. My under so, but I had worked for this uh, same company before on other designs. And one thing I could tell you that for the projects that I did with this company, now, now this was a totally separate kind of IT group that, man, you know, the one, it, it's how I got referred to this project, but even though it was the same umbrella company, the IT group that I had worked with on pre-deployment designs was different than this IT group that I was working with on this post-deployment, uh, um, you know, adjustment, if you want to call it that. Um, and uh, so I was not part of that process, but I do know when I was doing pre-deployment uh, design with uh, this this. Uh, you know, the, the overall company, they did kind of tell me price is no object. In, in fact, it, it was a little bit jarring to me because basically every job I've been on, people are tend to be concerned about the price. Oh, do we have to buy this many APs? Do we have to do this many cable drops, etc.? cetera? They, they were actually pushing me when I was doing the pre-deployment uh, uh, design, uh, design. They were pushing me to do more APs. They were like, look, Spend the money you want to spend, do more APs. So that might be the answer there uh, for Nam Nudler. Um, that might have been why they ended up with so many APs is just the integrators might have just been told price is no object, add as many, more APs is better than fewer APs. And so they might have just said, okay, blast out as many APs as, uh, as, as we think this thing can handle. Uh, yeah, for Slim, no. Uh, so the next question from Slim to None, did I create a channel map? No, it was it was one of those things where the organization had spent a ton of money pre-deployment, okay? And they made it very clear to me, look, Ben, we're bringing you in. This is not like the pre-deployment stuff you did elsewhere where we want you to, you know spend a lot of time and do full reports and everything like that. They were like, just fix the problem, write us up kind of a quick and dirty report and keep it to, you know, this certain budget level. Cause we've already spent an absolute ton of money. The owner of the company is aware of this office and aware it's not working and is very, very unhappy with us having spent all this money for a non-functional Wi-Fi network. So we can't go and, splash money at you you got to keep it uh, a little bit uh tighter and so no i did not do like a full channel map the floor plans that i gave them just showed the channel on the ap they did not show where the ap was expected to cover which is kind of a worthless thing anyway these channel maps you know tend to you know the, since things tend to have to change so often with wi-fi I find the channel map is a little bit of a waste of time anyway. But look, I'm happy to do one if someone's paying me. Um, <laughs> but for this one, they were like, no, 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 just give us the essentials. And so uh, I just gave them floor plans that showed the AP locations, showed the channel number, but then also 
uh, showed and and showed like the access point names so that they could correlate that the access point name the access point MAC address uh, the channel number and then also indicated if the radio had been disabled so that they could look back later and say oh, okay this radio here's been disabled we can re-enable it etc um, also little notifications for the we only had to do this in a couple places but for the few places where uh, we had to manually set the channel those got kind of a highlight to them so that again the day-to-day -day network engineers could look back at that document and say oh okay the Cisco RRM is not going to automatically change this channel, this access points channel, unless we go remove the manual channel assignment that that Ben gave it, essentially. Uh, so, yeah, let's see here. Uh, I did disable lower data rates. Slim was asking and, and mentioned kind of why that was. I would disagree. No, 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 but in best practice, you would disable six megabits per second data rate. I would say no. And, and I kind of explained why that was. Which APs? These were the 3802s from Cisco. Um, you know, that's... And look, you know, I, I know that technically it's a contrarian thing to say, but I don't look at it as contrarian uh, because I'm not saying the six megabits per second thing just to say something's different. You know, I, I, I admit I am a contrarian, but I, I really don't believe that this is a contrarian way of looking at things. You know, I, I explained the technological rationale behind why um, I'm a fan of keeping the six megabits per second rate because it's just, you know, the benefits outweigh the costs in my eyes. The, the benefit of knowing where your CCI is outweighs the cost of that half a percent of channel time taken up, assuming you're using three SSIDs, um, that you get with the 12 megabits per second. The one thing that does annoy me in the whole debate about data rates is this stupid thing about sticky clients. Oh my God, I mean... It's like, you know, honestly, this may sound a little bit harsh, but it is a little bit hard to respect someone's expertise in the realm of Wi-Fi if I hear the term sticky clients in relation to uh, minimum basic rates. They just don't have anything to do with one another. Anyone who's done the research on it knows that. And so, um, you know, that... that I've run into that a few times and, and not in the too distant past. So maybe that's why it's a sore subject to me. But yeah, there was one project I was working on not long ago. It ended up being fine. You know, it was at a hospital out here east of uh, LA. Uh, but yeah, that, that was kind of what was presented to me. You know, oh, you know, so you guys are using the higher minimum basic rates. Yeah, we're really worried about sticky clients. There's a lot of roaming and it's like, ugh, all right. I'm, I'm talking to someone who has enough knowledge to be dangerous. You know, it, here, here's one expression that I like to use a lot is, and this applies to virtually everything in life. Once you learn a little bit about something, you think you know a lot. It's only when you've learned a lot that you realize how little you know. I'm always learning when it comes to Wi-Fi. There's a ton of things that surprise me. I always remain open to new ideas and, and even recycled ideas that may sort of become true based on changes in how uh, devices behave, access points behave, users behave, etc. cetera. Um, but the guy at the hospital out east of LA, I think was in the phase of once you've learned a little about something, you think you know a lot, you think you've learned a lot and uh, or you know a lot. And uh, yeah, so it, it didn't end up being a big impediment that person was the head wireless person for the hospital, but the head IT person for the hospital system was also on site with us. So it might have been a little bit of a problem if, if like the head person wasn't there to kind of reel this guy in. But uh, but yeah, I, I just knew it. It's like as soon as I hear, oh, uh, we're worried about sticky clients, it's like, yep, there we go. That's uh, that's that's what we're uh, that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and Slim asked the question, what do we see from users who are experiencing the co-channel interference? The, the biggest thing that we were definitely having an issue with in the big office, the big open office, was mobility. It, it, was, it was just when people would move around the office from one access point to another, and I believe the reason was uh, at least partially co-channel interference, it was just that roaming process was too slow 
for people to keep their video calls going. And this was a company that did a lot of video conferencing. I wouldn't say there were a ton of people that actually used the video conferencing app on their phones, but the expectation from the IT group was we're supposed to be able to support usage of the video conferencing app on people's phones. And then, you know, when you hear from the user, hey, when I'm walking down the street to the metro uh, and I'm on cellular data, I can do this video conferencing fine. And when I'm in the office and I'm on the Wi-Fi, the video conferencing drops when I'm walking. That That's a really twist in the knife, you know? They're like, you know, look, y- y- why are you people even here? We could just ask the cell phone company to come in and, and give us a DAS inside here and get rid of Wi-Fi altogether for all we care. Um, you know, and so so that that was that was the the big thing. Honestly though, I really think that um the uh that that the issue with yeah, yeah, exactly. Sticky clients with the and this was when they had the 12 megabit per second. So that that's what they were getting was uh I, I don't know if you would call it sticky clients or if you would call it slow connection to the new AP. Because you know, I I did not notice cases where client devices were staying on their APs longer. I more so was noticing that when clients would try to connect to the new AP, that process would take longer. That so I wouldn't necessarily say the client was sticking. I would a little bit more so say that the client was, uh, you know, just taking too long to connect to the new AP. But, um, but yeah, so that uh. So, so that I, I would definitely say that the transmit power, though, was the bigger fix for the roaming. The transmit, because of this over deployment of APs and because RRM was initially set up without, you know, kind of restrictions, the APs were using a very, very low transmit power, a transmit power that was far lower than the client device. So I would definitely say raising the transmit power to a level that was closer to the client device level and making that, and the possibly even more important part, making that transmit power uniform so that every AP in the office was always using the same transmit power. That was definitely the bigger thing. The, you know, the data rate thing, in the end, it didn't really matter that much, right? It's like the 12 megabit per second worked fine, the six megabit per second, worked fine. The 12 worked a little bit better for those older clients, definitely. Um, but yeah, it, uh, uh, but yeah, the, the, you know, the myth that's out there with the sticky clients, just, to quickly go through, um, why this annoys me so much. So I kind of talked about it a little bit. Uh, so the idea is, you know, you have the, uh, 12 megabits per second boundary. Here's where the 12 megabits per second is. You have the six megabits per second boundary. And so kind of the myth that's out there when it comes to uh, the sticky client is I have my client device and my client device will say sort of, I don't see the AP. And therefore it is time to roam. And if the uh, client, if if you have the six megabit per second data rate enabled, then the client has to go a little bit further before it gets to that point. And, you know, this idea here is just a total misunderstanding of how client devices roam. Clients roam based on RSSI. And look, there can be some exceptions there on the margin. You know, different vendors, client devices can choose different uh, roaming protocol. So there may be some client devices that may sort of more proactively look for new APs. Um, I, I'm not aware of any client devices that use like motion sensors to trigger roaming or anything like that. But there could be client devices that start looking, even if the RSSI is relatively high, but just because of the fact that the signal strength changes, there could be clients that use motion sensors. So, but but in general, clients are going to roam based on RSSI. And by the time you reach the 12 megabits per second boundary, the RSSI is way 
too low already. So, so what I mean by that is the client device somewhere here or, oh, sorry, I forgot to get rid of the darn, sorry about that. <laughs> I sometimes make this mistake with the whiteboard. Let me uh, rewrite that. Apologies for a little time wasting there. So yeah, the issue here, access point. I have my little 12 megabit per second boundary of where the radio waves go. I have my little six megabits per second boundary of where the radio waves go. And uh, so the idea there, the, the theoretical idea there is my client device moves out beyond the 12 and the client device kind of says, I don't see the access point. And so that means time to roam. And, you know, so the theory there is, well, I could roam here when I'm beyond the 12, or if I leave the six megabits per second uh, as my minimum basic rate, then I'm going to have to roam all the way out here. And, and this is kind of the sticky part. Now, um, staying connected further away but that's that's just not how client devices work client devices roam based on rssi or clients devices will even roam more aggressively than the rssi would dictate uh, you know rssi is like the least aggressive way to roam but so what i mean by that is when my client device is moving away from the X point, my client is going to hit that roaming RSSI way before it can't see the AP. It's, it's just a total myth that the client is going to roam all this way and not see the AP, and then it's going to look for a new AP. Client devices are going to roam based on an RSSI that's way, way higher. Like, for example, with Apple devices, it's a known thing. For iOS devices, they roam based on a negative 65 dBm RSSI. Negative 65, I mean, that's a that's a going to be a pretty darn high signal strength. That's probably going to be somewhere around where, let's say, the negative, oh, it's not negative, I should say, the 48 megabit per second data rate would go, or maybe the 36 at the absolute lowest. I mean, heck, you might even get the 54 megabit per second data rate um, at, the, at a negative 65 dBm uh, RSSI. Probably not 54, but it's going to be a, a lot higher than 12. And so th th this whole idea of, oh, I need to make sure that my access point cells are smaller so that my client device no longer sees the access point and then roams, it's, it's just, it's fiction. It's just not in line with the way devices actually behave, the way smartphone devices actually behave. So that's, you know, that's the idea there. And I know I shouldn't let myself get so annoyed by uh, that whole thing and 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 everything like that, but I've, I've just had that happen so often. And look, obviously judging by the, you know, the big office uh, that I was telling you about earlier, I'm fine with disabling the, uh, the uh, low data rates. Absolutely fine with it especially if we see the client roaming is better, client connections are faster, whatever. But it's just, you you want to be aware of the fact that you lose the ability to accurately measure CCI. That's, that's the whole key. And so if you have an area where CCI could be an issue, then I am very, very much in favor of keeping the six megabit per second rate enabled at least until you fix the CCI issue. That's, that's kind of how I... Uh, how I look at that. Um, now, getting back to uh, Wireshark here, and I realize I'm already an hour and 45 in, so I'm going to have to kind of make a part two. I'll do a part two, hopefully on Friday. Hopefully on Friday, I'll uh, be able to do a part two here where we'll go a little bit beyond the discovery process. Uh, but yeah, if I'm uh, working on the uh, uh, discovery process here, what I want to do is I want to uh, use this signal strength and I just want to use the probe request. If you look at the little info column there, it says probe request. Um, I want to look at all of the probe requests. And if I see probe requests that are being transmitted at a, at a similar signal to my iPhone, to my little Apple device here, that's an indication that it's probably my Apple device using a fake Mac address while it probes. 
So I can go into the probe request here. I can see the probe request has the hexadecimal. Hopefully you can see it down there of 0x0 zero x zero, uh, of zero x zero 4 or I guess you could use three zeros. And so I just put in that little filter here, wlan.fc.type underscore, whoops, subtype equals equals 0x04, zero zero hit enter. Notice in the info column, these are all now probe requests. And these probe requests that I am seeing around my signal strength are probably from my iPhone. Um, most likely this guy's from my iPhone, this one's from my iPhone, this one's from my iPhone, this one's from my iPhone. Most likely this is my iPhone going around in looking for networks. You see SSID is listed, is empty. There's uh, there's no SSID. Uh, so, so that means my iPhone was just looking for any network that was out there in its attempt to connect. But I can go a little bit deeper in this list. And I think all of these had empty SSIDs. Make sure here, yeah, wildcard SSID, that means empty. But yeah, as I go through this list here, here I, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, probes that were uh, at that low signal strength. It might have been because I already connected and so my device might have stopped probing. But there's the last one. Oh, and this one's actually from my device. This was the probe that my phone sent when it made its connection. So when my phone made its connection, it sent this uh, message. Ooh, here's someone whose uh, device is kind of telling the world uh, what, what the device is trying to connect to. So someone's trying to connect to T-Mobile Wingman. Someone's trying to connect to OTA, A-H-M-O-T-A, C-H-O-T-A. Usually this happens when SSIDs are hidden. So someone's uh, client device connected to a hidden SSID at some point, probably called OTA or A-H-M-O-T-A or C-H-O-T-A. And because of the fact that that network was hidden, the device remembered that, hey, if I want to connect to this network, I have to probe using the real SSID. So that that's probably what happened with those. Let's see if we see any others. So the, uh, this is my device's real MAC address. So now my device had clearly found its network. And uh, you, yeah, you can see it right there. My client was probing. First probing, it looks like with a fake MAC address. So my client Notice this is uh, not my real MAC address, Apple underscore 47B03A. That's my real MAC address. So my client was probing with a fake MAC address for Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus. And then once it found out from the access point that, yes, Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus exists, then my uh, client probed with its real MAC address as part of starting the connection process. Let's see if there's any other earlier. So here's some more earlier probing, just probing for anything. And yeah, so so this gives you this can give you a little bit of idea of how often the client is probing. Um, you know, uh, this can give you an idea of whether the client is you know going to listen for you know going to probe on different channels. If if I had this capture set up on different channels simultaneously, I could get an idea of whether the client probed on channel 149 first or or probed on another channel first, uh, etc. So yeah. So I know I didn't get very far into the connection process today. You know, sometimes I talk too much or meander to other, you know, to different topics too much. Uh, but uh, we got through at least a little bit of it. So th this will kind of act as our part one. So part one is when a client is looking to make a connection and whether you want this information for troubleshooting, where, whether you're going to use this information as part of your design process, the first step is the client is going to go through discovery to try to find access points. When the client goes through discovery, the client is going to always look for access points that are broadcasting with the SSID configured in the client. So I configured Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus in my client. So that's why my client was looking for access points that use the SSID of Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus. And then... Uh, and when the client goes through the discovery process, it's going to be some combination of listening for beacon frames from the access points and transmitting 
probe responses, probe requests to get back probe responses. As far as how the client does that, that's the part that can be vendor specific. We know that RSSI plays a role. We know that clients tend to gravitate towards the BSSID, the MAC address coming from the access point, the BSSID that has the highest signal strength possible, the highest RSSI possible. But beyond that, you know, once once we get beyond RSSI, it's going to really vary. Some clients may only probe on channels they remember. Some clients may not do as much probing. Some clients may go through the whole gamut of channels. You know, it, it's really going to depend. But here's the bottom line. Here's kind of the last little note that I want to leave uh, you all with before we wrap up part number one here. Uh, the last little note I want to leave with you all is after discovery or, or basically in discovery, the whole point of discovery is that the client chooses a BSS ID. And remember, a BSS ID, for those who may not be aware, is a wireless MAC address of an access point wireless MAC address of an access point. So that's the whole uh, discovery process. Now, when we do part two of hopefully only two parts, maybe it'll have to go a little longer. When we go part two, we'll talk about what happens after discovery. And so we'll talk about the wireless part of what happens. We'll talk about the network part. We'll talk about uh, security that can affect um, VLANs, routing and switching, all, all sort of uh, internet service, device issues. We'll talk about all sorts of things that can potentially affect the connection process. So we'll just treat this as uh, episode number one. Thank you for joining everyone. Um, the BSS ID is a MAC address of an AP Slim. I don't know how else to say it. It's a MAC address. It's wireless. It comes from an AP. If there's uh, something I'm missing there, feel free to uh, let me know. But uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a MAC address. It's wireless. It comes from an AP. Um, I guess not. No, 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 no. What, what, what I'm saying is, I, I saw that you said not, but I'm saying it is. BSS ID um, no, no, I know that an AP has a physical Mac. I'm talking, a, a, AP has a physical wired Mac. Macs are always physical, right? Like the wireless physical layer is still physical. So the, the AP has wired Mac address for each port, at least one wired Mac address for each port. And the AP has wireless Mac addresses, uh, that are BSS IDs. That's, uh, the way the AP works. I, so... Maybe that's uh, the 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 kind of mix up there, uh, but yeah, APs are gonna have, you know, at least one wired MAC address. I I know, you know, I'm not aware of any enterprise off the rack APs that do internal virtualization to the point that an AP would need multiple wireless, uh, sorry, multiple wired MAC addresses on a single port. So if you're getting like an off the rack enterprise AP that you're not changing the code of, you're not installing anything on, um, then uh, then then there would just be one MAC address for each wired port, and then there would also be a number of MAC addresses wirelessly, and those wireless MAC addresses are the BSS IDs. Um, but yeah, that's the. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I guess it's probably just uh, different ways of saying the same thing. But yeah, so uh, appreciate everybody sticking around uh, a little bit longer. I'm trying to keep these sessions to more like 90 minutes. Obviously, I went close to two hours today. We will get to part two Friday unless something happens. You know, if if, uh, if something comes up on last week, something came up on for actually the last two weeks, something came up on Friday. Uh, but, uh, I'm going to do part two on Friday unless something happens. Either way, I will definitely be back next week, Wednesday, uh, at 10 AM barring something happening, I suppose. And, uh, we'll keep going with the Wi-Fi connection stuff until I uh, get through it. Have a good one, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands. Don't put your dirty fingers in your mouth, uh, et cetera. Social distancing and all that. 
uh, have a uh, have a good one.